Hello, this is a reading by C.S. Lewis and it's entitled Horrid Red Things. Many theologians and some scientists are now ready to proclaim that the 19th century conflict between science and religion is over and done with. But even if this is true, it is a truth known only to real theologians and real scientists, that is, to a few highly educated men. To the man in the street, the conflict is still perfectly real, and in his mind it takes a form which the learned hardly dream of. The ordinary man is not thinking of particular dogmas and particular scientific discoveries. What troubles him is an all-pervading difference of atmosphere between what he believes Christianity to be and that general picture of the universe which he has picked up from living in a scientific age. He gathers from the creed that God has a son, just as if God were a God like Odin or Jupiter, that this son came down like a parachutist from heaven, first to earth and later to some land of the dead situated beneath the earth's surface. That still later, he ascended into the sky and took his seat in a decorated chair, placed a little to the right of his father's throne. The whole thing seems to imply a local and material heaven, a palace in the stratosphere, a flat earth and all the rest of those archaic misconceptions. The ordinary man is well aware that we should deny all the beliefs he attributes to us and interpret our creed in a different sense. But this by no means satisfies him, no doubt, he thinks, once those articles of belief are there, they can be allegorised or spiritualised away to any extent you please. But is it not plain that they would never have been there at all if the first generation of Christians had had any notion of what the real universe is like? A historian who has based his work on the misreading of a document may afterwards when his mistake has been exposed, exercise great ingenuity in showing that his account of a certain battle can still be reconciled with what the document records. But the point is that none of these ingenuous explanations would ever have come into existence if he had read his documents correctly at the outset. They are therefore really a waste of labour. It would be manlier of him to admit his mistakes and begin all over again. I think there are two things that Christians must do if they wish to convince this ordinary, modern man. In the first place, they must make it quite clear that what will remain of the creed after all their explanations and reinterpretations will still be something quite unambiguously supernatural, miraculous and shocking. We may not believe in a flat earth and a sky palace, but we must insist from the beginning that we believe, as firmly as any savage or theosophist, in a spirit world which can and does invade the natural or phenomenal universe. For the plain man suspects that when we start explaining, we are going to explain away, that we have mythology for our ignorant hearers and are ready when cornered by educated hearers to reduce it to innocuous moral platitudes, which no one ever dreamed of denying. And there are theologians who justify this suspicion. From them we must part company absolutely. If nothing remains except what could be equally well stated without Christian formulae, then the honest thing is to admit that Christianity is untrue and to begin over again without it. In the second place, we must try to teach something about the difference between thinking and imagining. It is, of course, an historical error to suppose that all, or even most, early Christians believed in the Sky Palace in the same sense in which we believe in the solar system. Anthropomorphism was condemned by the church as soon as the question was explicitly before her. But some early Christians may have done this, and probably thousands never thought of their faith without anthropomorphic imagery. That is why we must distinguish the core of belief from the attendant imagining. When I think of London, I always see a picture of Euston Station. But I do not believe that London is Euston Station. That is a simple case, because there, are, there the thinker knows the imagery to be false. Now let us take a more complex one. I heard a lady tell her daughter that if you ate too much aspirin tablets, you would die. But why? asked the child. If you squash them, don't you find horrid red things inside them? 
obviously when this child thought of poison, she not only had an attendant image of horrid red things, but she actually believed that poison was red. And this is an error. But how far does it invalidate her thinking about poison? She learned that an overdose of aspirin would kill you. Her belief was true. She knew within limits which of the substances in her mother's house were poisonous. If I, staying in the house, had raised a glass of what looked like water to my lips and the child had said, don't drink that, mummy says it's poisonous, I should have been foolish to disregard the warning on the ground that this child has an archaic and mythological idea of poison as horrid red things. There is thus a distinction not only between thought and imagination in general, but even between thought and those images which the thinker falsely believes to be true. When the child learned later that poison is not always red, she would not have felt that anything essential in her beliefs about poison had been altered. She would still know, as she had always known, that poison is what kills you if you swallow it. That is the essence of poison. The erroneous beliefs about colour drop away without affecting that. In the same way, an early peasant Christian may have thought that Christ sitting at the right hand of the Father really implied two chairs of state in a certain spatial relation inside a sky palace. But if the same man afterwards received a philosophical education and discovered that God has no body, parts or passions, and therefore neither a right hand nor a palace, he would not have felt that the essentials of his belief had been altered. What had mattered to him, even in the days of his simplicity, had not been supposed details about celestial furniture. It had been the assurance that the once crucified master was now the supreme agent or the unimaginable power on whom the whole universe depends. And he would recognize that in this he had never been deceived. The critic may still ask us why the imagery, which we admit to be untrue, should be used at all. But he has not noticed that any language we attempt to substitute for it would involve imagery that is open to all the same objections. To say that God enters the natural order involves just as much spatial imagery as to say that he comes down. One has simply substituted horizontal or undefined for vertical movement. To say that he is reabsorbed into the noumenal is better than to say he ascended into heaven. Only if the picture of something dissolving in warm fluid or being sucked into a throat is less misleading than the picture of a bird or a balloon going up. All language, except about objects of sense, is metaphorical through and through. To call God a force, that is something like a wind or a dynamo, is as metaphorical as to call him a father or a king. On such matters, we can make our language more polysyllabic and duller, we cannot make it more literal. The difficulty is not peculiar to theologians. Scientists, poets, psychoanalysts and metaphysians are all in the same boat. Man's reason is in such deep insolvency to sense. Where then do we draw the line between explaining and explaining away? I do not think there is much difficulty. All that concerns the unicarnate activities of God, his operation on that plane of being where sense cannot enter, must be taken along with imagery which we know to be in the literal sense untrue. But there can be no defence for applying the same treatment to the miracles of the incarnate God. They are recorded as events on this earth which affected human senses. They are the sort of thing we can describe literally. If Christ turned water into wine and we had been present, we could have seen, smelled and tasted. The story that he did so is not of the same order as his sitting at the right hand of the Father. It is either fact or legend or lie. You must take it or leave it. I hope that you all take it. God bless and I'll see you next time. Bye.